China is the only country that currently has a regulation in place. It's only for generative AI. It started uh, summer last year. And the main reason that I started is uh, because uh, I believe the Chinese government understand that disinformation, which is the, one of the main dangers of, of generative AI, can affect any government. It's getting harder and harder to distinguish between an authentic image and a, an AI-generated image, an authentic video and an AI-generated video. If we keep going in that way, then we, we become like, like the hair movie where for example, a man gets in love with a machine. If you have children um, or youngsters who want to go to college or who want to pursue a career, what would you recommend them to choose? Hey everyone, welcome to the Singularity Syndicate podcast. Today, we're super excited to have Dr. Ricardo Beza Yates with us. He's the director of research at the Institute for Experiential AI at Northeastern University and is an expert in AI ethics and safety. Welcome, doctor, to the program. Yeah, thank you. So let's start with this. So does these models impress you when they start? Like, let's start with that normal chat GPT. And as you can see, the, they are getting better and better with every month. So what do you think about these models? Yeah, what I guess what impresses me is, is that it's not that difficult to imitate us. And, and, and that's what expresses me, like, like the, the very high level of imitation that they can, they can get. And then all people believe that they are more than they are because they are imitating us so well. And this is the problem because many people believe that these, uh, chatbots may think or may read or may write when they are just predicting things. But the argument here, and this begs the question that doesn't our brain do the same? Well, we don't know exactly how the brain works. Uh, I mean, neuroscientists have worked many, many years and, and, and they have a better understanding, for example, that we have columns of neurons and, and remember the, the brain is, a, is not a discrete system, it is an analogic system and also it's not only electric but also chemical. So, so we don't understand very well how the brain works, but I don't think that we do the same kind of predictions. Uh, in because even though we can say that we do predictions, I think we understand them. So, for example, we can do predictions of things that we had never seen before. Basically, you will change your mind without having any data from the past because of something you understood and you decide to take action in a completely different way. For example, let's say you always go one way to from your place to, to your work and suddenly you see a tree that has fallen in the road, you change your way. And this is the first time you have done, uh, done it. So it's nothing about the data, but it's about you, you are understanding the situation and probably an AI system will not be able to predict what's the right uh, action at the time because it doesn't have anything in the training data to decide that. Right. And you speak a lot about responsible AI, AI safety, bias. Could you Help us uh, paint a picture on why this is so important, especially in this day and age. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a very broad question because there are so many topics involved, but, but I would say that, that there is a hype on the things that AI can do and, and many of them will be very useful for humanity. However, we are not aware of all the issues that may be creating and something that grows so fast also will have problems growing the same at the same speed, maybe less. But for example, the, recently the OECD uh, launched a monitor of AI incidents. And now we have something like, uh, like tens of incidents per week. And this is growing exponentially too, like, like the, the usage of, of the technology. So we need to understand what we, what is the impact, for example, from from simple things like discrimination and bias, like, like basically learning about data that have maybe systemic societal biases. Two more, more things that are more newer that, that, for example, are having that chat DBTs or other chatbots are, are doing. For example, that people believe they are talking to humans and then uh, humanize them 
Uh, and then, for example, the worst incident was last year when a person in Belgium committed suicide after talking six weeks to a chatbot. And if you see the last conversation that looks like a science fiction movie, uh, the chatbot helped him on taking the decision. Even worse, the understanding was that after killing himself, they will meet in the afterlife. And also he chose a, a woman as an avatar and called it El Eliza, like the first chatbot that was the, the, the signed in, in MIT in 1966. So these models, they have a lot of safeguards and um, guard la- guardrails. And in the beginning, people were um, hijacking those guardrails. But now the guardrails are getting better and better and, and making it more safe. And in line with that, you've seen we've seen countries like China uh, implemented an AI regulation. You also talked about this in your lectures. Uh, EU also the uh, GDPR also launched a regulation, and the White House also issued a paper. So, what does these regulations help in doing, and what is still missing? Before answering that, I don't believe the guardrails are very useful because th- these guardrails are, are, as you said, they are guardrails. They are not, they are not embedded into the models. It is like trying to put barriers. But for me, putting barriers is like trying to stop, uh, I don't know, a, a place where you have a lot of holes and water is coming out and then you, you put a, a, a barrier for one hole and then you create another 10 in other place. So it's, we're talking about an open domain, so it's very hard to put guardrails that are universal. You need to embed the, the, this in the model, and, and we don't know yet how to do that. Now, regarding regulations, yeah, China is the only country that currently has a regulation in place. It's only for generative AI. They started uh, summer last year. And the main reason they started is uh, because uh, I believe the Chinese government understand that disinformation which is the, one of the main dangers of, of, of generative AI, can affect any government. So, for example, if you put enough disinformation in a country, it doesn't matter if you are a democracy or not, the country will suffer uh, the consequences. And I think that's the reason that they have one a very, very so, solo. And of course, that has a political part, but after we delete the political part, they have a very solo a regulation of all the main problems, not only this information, but for example, copyright protection, contestability, uh, everything that we, we, we humanize them. So not trying not to, to, to believe that these things are, are closer to us and so on. Now, the EU AI Act, because GDPR is the data protection regulation that's already in place. The EU AI Act was voted uh, was approved last March in the Parliament of the EU, but it seems that they voted the wrong version. So they are trying to fix that problem, that small human problem that they 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 were not voting the last one. And the last one had to do with generative AI because there was a there was a disagreement between some countries, especially Italy, Germany, and France, which are the main countries of the EU, on, for example, open source language models. And they were trying to, to basically agree that if the regulation should be the same for private models or for open models, which is a very good question that it's not easy to answer because the dangers are the same, uh, but the uses are a bit different because one is more expensive than the other. And in the case of the U.S., I think the last year, uh, executive order of Biden helped because already we have this AI safety institute underneath. But I haven't seen too many, too many advances on, on the, on the real regulation side. So I hope to see this year, uh, some, at least proposals, because we need to, I think we need to, to, to worry about this information. We have an election this year, presidential election, uh, and this information is already being used in a massive way in many, many countries. This year, we have more than 17 countries voting. It's the year that more people on earth will vote. And maybe the best example today is India, where the two main parties are attacking the other party with basically false information done with generative AI, including videos and so on. You know, today we can, we can fake anyone with the right face, with the right voice, and then you can put any message on what they, they are saying. Uh, and uh, I want to say something else that is important 
Ah, and, and of course, uh, we need to worry about copyright protection because in some sense, it's happening the same that did happen with uh, face recognition technology. Maybe most people don't know, but this face recognition system were trained with images from the web they didn't have your consent to be used. So you never gave your consent to use your face for training the system. But now it's even worse. Um, we, we don't have the consent of many, many of the uh, texts that are used in the web, that they were used by all the chatbots to, to, to learn. And we have many uh, cases in, in court, like New York Times, end of last year, CU OpenAI, Stability was sued by Getty Images also last year. So we have several important cases that, depending on the on the resolution of these cases, uh, things may change. So some people argue that regulations um, are not necessary, not effective. So it's the internet. You know, you know how government tried to stop the torrent websites, the Pirate Bay, and they never been able to. You know, blockchain and, and crypto is all already there and nobody is able to stop it. You know, some governments makes it illegal, but it's the Internet. And there's people like Professor Jan Lacoon where they're like preaching for open source. And they think that the more we put regulations on AI, the more we create barriers to entry where all only the big, powerful companies can build these models, where in fact, we need exactly the opposite of regulation. We need a more open culture in this, in this, and build an open infrastructure. How would you um, answer these arguments? So I think there are two different conflicting arguments in what you said that are different, and I, I prefer not to mix them. For example, open source models and private models. I think this is a one completely different dimension and has nothing to do with regulation. You can have open models with regulation too. Uh, I, I, it's, it's the same problem. I don't think it's really more expensive to create that too, if you want to do it. And, and Facebook, for example, Meta is doing it. And, and, and for example, Emirates has also a very large public model and so on. And regarding the regulation argument that typically, typically the, the, the regulation will kill innovation or, or will kill competitiveness. I, I don't believe that. I think that's a fallacy. If you think about the main innovations that the humanity has done in the past, they have been when they have more problems. So basically, innovation comes when you are almost dying or you are almost uh, in, in a crisis. Because if you don't have any crisis, you, know, you don't need to innovate. You just keep going. Uh, maybe you can you can think about innovating to earn money, but the real innovations happens when, uh, for example, mature fire was one of the first when you couldn't eat too much and, and you wanted to cook meat. And finally, someone said, oh, I know how to do fire. And then, then things change. And maybe that's a starting point of civilization. So I think good regulation triggers the best innovation. Basically, you, you do everything under certain framework that helps you to basically do good because we need to, to, to think about how to, how to do good. Today, people don't think about how, how to improve well-being of people. They are thinking only on how to earn more money. And I think you can earn maybe not a billion, but half a billion. And that's enough. I mean, who wants more? <laughs> so, so I think that there's no, I think we are seeing like a hyper capitalism that is not helping innovation. The, we shouldn't be thinking about how to earn more money. We should be thinking how to empower people, and that will bring money anyway. And so we need to think in a different way, and, and a basic innovation will help. Maybe something simple, like we have human rights, and someone can say this is a regulation. Yes, it's regulation, but that helps to, to live together in, in, in peace, although we still don't enforce human rights uh, all over. Yeah, in one of your lectures, you mentioned, and I think it's clear to a lot of people now that it's getting harder and harder to distinguish between an authentic image and a, an AI generated image, an authentic video and an AI generated video. And you mentioned that we've, humanity lost 
something important because and I, and and this resonates a lot to to me because imagine a robber came to your house and you have these security cameras and you captured that robber on camera. Now, if I cannot present this video to court to prove that this person has robbed my house, and of course I'm I'm making a very simple example here, but if this video is not presentable to court, if an image is not presentable to court due to all these fake images and fake videos available, I mean, we're going back to really the Stone Age almost. Yeah, you are completely right. I think I think we we this ourselves by well some 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 companies decided to destroy uh, what I call the digital truth. So the ability to to use the digital media, for example, not only to find a, a person that is uh, attempt, attempting to your privacy, but also for example to learn about what is happening in countries that before it was very hard to to get news. Uh, for example, let's say the Arab Spring. That clearly we learn about what was happening in North Africa and other countries thanks to, to, to social media and, and videos and, and images. So now we lost that. Sadly, we lost in, in, in one year, we lost something we, we, we had built in more than 20 years. And, and I don't know how to, how to change that. Last year, we published a paper with um, several very well known people saying that if you put a model, in public, like uh, in the sense that if you put a, a, a model that is a generative model that is uh, uh, available for use, doesn't matter if it's private or open, you need to do to put at the same time another model that will tell you if an output of the generative AI model was produced by that model or not. So basically, you need to have like a transparency tool that you can say, okay, who did this? And you, you will need to try many models and say, oh, this was OpenAI, this was, was, was uh, for example, a mid-journey and so on. So it's like compulsory that you need to have this, uh, this special glass where you can, you can say, okay, this one was generated. Because otherwise, as you said, we will not be able to use anything, any digital media, in, in, for example, in court. And I, I don't think we're going back to the Stone Age, but I think we're going back to, to last century. <laughs> and then you will need to have a, a people that, that will testify. Yes, I saw this person doing that. And, and that, that's a pity because uh, it's more complicated. But if you think in some sense, we already had problems on, on using other things like, like, like facial recognition and other t- techniques that may fail. And uh, even when they recognize a person and they have false positives, for example. And so we already had this problem, but it's not as bad as we have it today. Um, a guest on my podcast once came and told me that one solution to that could be t- that all the phones and all the cameras in the world, whenever a, a photo is snapped, it will uh, be recorded on a blockchain. And this one way to preserve the authenticity of, of, of this content. Do you think this is feasible or might be an opportunity for, uh, for further research? No, I think that's feasible. I think that, that if, if we, we can use blockchain to, to know what is true or what is not, that would be great. But we need to do research to make sure that, that this cannot be uh, basically uh, deceived. Right. So now I want to talk about the humanization. Uh, you, you always say people should not humanize technology. Can you please speak more about that and why it's important not to, um, not to give uh, AI some sort of uh, anthropomorphism, it's called? I don't know what it's called. Yes, it's a trope of, uh, I use the word humanize because it's very hard to use the other word. <laughs> And, and also because that word is, is really related to the shape. So it basically is to put a human shape to, to robots and all that. But I think it's more than that because it's not only the shape. It's, it's basically the attitude that we have uh, to them. And, and the, pro- the first problem is that we start using human words to, for them. For example, we said that they read. They don't read. They process text because they don't understand what they are processing. They, they, some people will say they write. But they don't write text. They just output text because they don't understand what they're writing. Uh, and then people will say they ha- hallucinate. 
But you know, to, to hallucinate, you need to understand the world and they don't understand the world. So they really are not hallucinated. That was a really re- great marketing move from OpenAI to, to don't say that they are making mistakes. And we, and I keep going like in artificial intelligence. Like, uh, for example, Kate Crawford will say it's not artificial nor intelligent, nor artificial because it uses a lot of natural resources. And it's not intelligent because it's a different kind of intelligence. Maybe we can call it computational intelligence, but it's not human intelligence. And then we can, I can keep going on. And for example, there is no ethical AI because it says it's, it's human. Uh, there's no trustworthy AI because you are putting the burden on the user. And for that, you need to work all the time. And we, we know it doesn't work all the time. So it's why we're asking people to, to trust it and so on. So when we start using things like, for example, some people may say that they think and they reason and there are recent papers that show that they are not reason. They predict very well almost all the time. And this prediction, this imitation game, which was a original name for the Turing test by, by Turing because he never, he was never speaking about the test. And he says in one of the, their, their papers that he thinks that they will never be able to think like humans. That was his opinion. If we keep going in that way, then we, we become like, like the hair movie where, for example, a, a man gets uh, in love with a machine or, or, or we go to, to what happened at the, what I said at the beginning last year in Belgium, where a person uses this to, as a psychologist and, and, and the, the conversation goes in the wrong direction and, and, and at the end recommends to, to kill himself. I think we are seeing that. For example, last year in China, some person uh, basically created uh, an avatar of his grandmother and was perfect. Face, voice, uh, all the communication with the grandmother, so talked like the grandmother. And at some point, this is not healthy. It's not mentally healthy. So so at which point another person before uh, resuscitated his dead fiancé and so on. So we need to put limits because this is just the beginning. And, and imagine that in the future, people think that these um, chatbots have emotions that are sentient, that they're conscious. Um, well, there was a Google engineer that believed that. <laughs> so so even even people that you say is smart is it, captured by this imitation game. So I'm, that's why I think it's really important to to not do that and, and to be very precise. Because if we do it, if the, if the people that understand technology does it, what we can expect from people in the street? They will do it too. They will learn. They will think that they are like uh, smart. But if I would push back a little bit on this, so you mentioned that we also don't know how the brain works. So if we really don't know how the brain works, um, why would we not at least ga- make it as an option that? The, these machines are thinking, are thinking, or these machines are basically may get aware and may get, may have an experience of what is like to be an AI, for example, which is touching on consciousness. Yeah, but some people will will say that to to do that they need to have a body, so we need to 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 have some embodiment, like like to 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 have a, a senses and and feel the world and understand it. So that may be true in the future. I don't, I'm not saying that can cannot be true, but today generative AI is just is is like it's like putting yourself in in a prison in a dark room, and then you you listen to all the books in the in the world, and then you have to try to imagine the world. You will not imagine the world as it is because you are just reading. You are not. I'm sorry. You are processing text, but in the case you are in the prison, you are reading. Even even you as a as a human reader will not be able to understand the world in the same way that we understand it when we feel the world. And so this is the, the first problem. And second, let me g- give you the argument back. Let's say you can do this all the time well, except 0.1%. 0.1% of the time, you do something silly. For example, you do something what I call a non-human error. So you made a mistake that a human will never make. For example, typical no common sense mistake that this happens with the, with the language models that generate text that doesn't make any sense because of certain uh, special case. I think that's the difference between humans and, and these models. 
Maybe the difference is only in this 0.1%, but they fail to show the humanity. And and if you think, it's very similar to DNA. So I, I used this metaphor the other day, and, and someone liked it. So, for example, the, the DNA of a mouse is 99% the same of a human. And the DNA of a chimpanzee, I think, is like 99.9% the same of a human. But we can talk. They cannot. So this 0.1% difference, it's a lot. They, we do things that they cannot do. So the argument that basically almost all the time they work doesn't work for me. Maybe the difference is very small, but if it's a difference, it's not human. And I, I, I think that's my point. So the, doesn't, even if it's 99.9% correct, if sometimes they do unexpected errors because they're not human, this is when we will get in trouble. For example, I'm sure that any human, even, even if it's a drunk, will recognize a woman crossing at night in a bicycle, like what happened in Arizona, and the self-driving Uber car killed her. Yeah, and speaking of language and how, you know, how we human developed language, after millions and billions of years of evolution, we managed to, to get this marvel into our, into our system. We developed the vocal cords to do it. We developed the wiring in the brain to be able to learn mm -hmm. language and communicate. And language, oftentimes people look down at language, although language is the catalyst of all information. So most of our intelligence is encapsulated within the, the limits of that language. And when we, when, when a machine is able to understand and respond with language, especially sometimes even better than the average human, I, I mean, I started this podcast just to discuss the implications of that particularly. Mm. And this is, this fascinates me every day. And with every new evolution of this technology, I'm also more fascinated. So what do you think the implications on the sense of what is what does it mean to be human and where this technology is going and, and, and what does it mean for a machine to master language? Yeah, but for example, you are humanizing again the, 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 the technology because they don't they don't understand anything. So so these these technologies don't understand what they are processing or what they're outputting. They are predicting. And most of the time, they predict very well, but they don't have the same understanding as I have. So, so it looks like they understand, they, they, it looks like they have intention, uh, but they don't have any of these things. So basically, that's why I call it the imitation game, because they're doing so well that we are, we are fooled, because we're humans, we are fooled by this machine thinking that, that they are much better than, than they are. So I think that's why it's so important not to humanize them, because if we use, uh, Verbs like understanding, then we're already saying that they are like us, but they are not like us. They, they're just prediction. Uh, and that's why, depending on the amount of data, they can do worse. So, so I think the implication is not in the technology side. The implication is in our side. For example, we are, we also have weaknesses. We are, for example, some weaknesses are, for example, with social media, we start to procrastinate a lot and we love to procrastinate. Now, with uh, these technologies, we um, will start to be lazy a lot. Because if they output text that is better than yours, you will say, well, let this machine do it for me because they can do it better. And even if you can do it better, you will take less time. So if you want to save time, laziness also, laziness also kicks in and, and, and you do that. And there was a very interesting op ed last year in time that was called. Uh, AI and the rise of mediocrity. And I'm seeing this. If all people decide that these uh, models can replace things that they do every day, the problem is not that you will forget about how to write by hand. This will be a possibility. Like today, people cannot find the place without the GPS. The problem is that if you don't write by hand, if you don't write by yourself, technically, you, are, you stop thinking. Basically, you talk about language, 
communicating is about not only language, it's about thinking. And by the way, the vocal cords were there. Uh, all animals can make sounds. Uh, the difference is that for what you use them. And of course, you need to train them to, to, to use it well. But uh, parrots also can talk and, and, and maybe even whales talk in, in, in their own, own way. So if we don't practice to be human, uh, uh, that is my main worry. We will, instead of evolve, we will involve because we will not think. As basically, uh, for example, when humankind solved all the basic needs is when we started to think about the world. For example, looking at the stars, thinking about astronomy, thinking about philo philosophy. I feel that now we are going the other way around. I, I, and I think this is the main danger, to, to go the other way around, to, to let machines do everything, and we don't think. Yeah, that's also very uh, interesting because uh, you're right. I mean, when, when, when our phone numbers became all in, in our phones, we stopped memorizing phone numbers. Uh, when, yes. <laughs> you know, if I cannot go five minutes away without putting the GPS on my car. Mm -hmm. So are we losing some features of our brain or when we don't use them? I, I think we're losing abilities. Uh, and, and we are then depending on other technologies. For example, uh, today, if we don't have uh, internet, uh, you cannot go out of your house <laughs> because you cannot find a place. Or maybe if you have electricity, you will have, be, uh, have a hard time uh, surviving because there are a lot of things that depends on electricity and so on. So, yes, we are losing abilities and we should keep them. For example, maybe, maybe like a, a scout's training for young people to be compulsory because if they're lost in a, in a forest and they don't know basic surviving skills, we're in trouble. And for example, recently we had a very big uh, solar storm that's strongest in 20 years and we saw beautiful uh, auroras and other lights, northern lights. But the problem is what happens if, for example, we have much bigger and let's say all internet and electricity is gone. What will happen to us? I think we're depending too much in technology and also we are doing it too, too focused on efficiency. When COVID, for example, showed us that, that it's also important to be resilient, uh, to, to be prepared to, to, to have more than one alternative. We need to have a plan B just in case. And, and today we never have a plan B. Yeah, I want to switch now to AGI. Again, one of your lectures, <laughs> you said that you don't believe in AGI. But I, but I think it would be helpful for us to define AGI first, and then we talk why you don't believe in it. So in your mind, what is AGI and why you don't believe in it? Yeah, so, so if AGI is to create, uh, uh, for example, uh, an entity that is smarter than us, or, or, or as smart as us, that would be AGI, AGI for me. That would be the definition. So like, let's try to be God and create something like, like us. I don't believe in, in that in, in the sense, not, not because we cannot do it. Maybe we can do it. I don't know. I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Maybe it is possible to play God. But my problem is that if we get closer to that, the danger is not AGI. It's people using AI to control other people. And this is the history of, of humankind. Basically, uh, stronger nations conquering uh, weaker nations. So uh, I see that this is the problem. So the problem will be that before we can have AGI, <laughs> there will be another kind of uh, I don't know, matrix or whatever um, science fiction movie you like that will change uh, our, our society. Now, if we can do, now let's say if we can do AGI and we have something smarter than us, I already know the answer. If you come to Earth, like there's also the, uh, uh, aliens may exist. If you come to Earth and you see Earth, any any smart uh, civilization will say, "Oh, we have a parasite here. They're called humans, and typically the only way to treat with parasites is uh, exterminate them." So if I am smarter than humankind, I will do the same. I mean, this this planet is being killed, like uh, the Avatar movie. We need to do something to to save it, and probably the answer will be, "Let's destroy humans." But it's not because this AGI destroyed human, it's because at the end we created something that destroyed us. So we are the really stupid people here. 
But this is a uh, pessimistic view. There's, on the other side, there's people who, who think that it's going to bring utopia to humanity. They think when, um, if AI becomes super intelligent, it will look at the human experience as a light in this universe, and it will try mm -hmm. its best to protect that light. Because, you know, honestly, if we think about it, like, so far, we haven't uh, seen life anywhere in, in our galaxy. And we are extraordinary. And if, if a superior intelligence would look at the human experience, you know, they would, I think they would try to preserve it and protect it. Well, probably, well, we don't, I, I think there is life in, I mean, I, like Carl Sagan would say that there's life in this galaxy, but we were, we haven't found it yet. We're too far. I mean, the distance between even our galaxy are too far. But maybe if, if there's some smart civilization outside the Earth, maybe they don't want to get in contact with us because we are a really aggressive uh, uh, race. So, so I would understand that there are many jokes about that. Let's not mess this. They, they, they are messing the planet. Better not to leave them alone and never contact them. This could be a possibility. But I'm also positive in the sense that we can have a utopia. But for, to have an utopia, we don't need a, a, a smart AI. We just need AI that does everything that we don't like to do. And then we can do the human things that we like to do. There was a very good tweet uh, the other, a few weeks ago from a Polish woman said, I don't want AI to do my writing so I can do my laundry. I want AI to do my laundry so I can do more writing. And this is the point. I, imagine if you can explore your potential in the things you want to do. Like uh, you want to be a writer, a poet, a painter, a dancer, a musician. Imagine if all people can do that while machines are doing the rest. We don't need a smart AI to do that. We just need good AI. And so why we are trying to play God? If you see, if you see that the people trying to play God are all men, that's a problem. Women don't want to create something really smarter than them because they are, I believe they are emotionally smarter than I. You don't want to create something that is more intelligent than you. That's amazing. And you are at the helm of a research institute in Northeastern University. And do you see a way, as you mentioned, using AI for the, for the drudgery work um, and, and help researchers focus on you know, more creative pursuits and let the AI do the, the, the nitty gritty. Like, for example, like, for example, a lot of people, um, would, you know, think that the literature review in a, in a, in a, in a master's thesis, for example, is a lot of manual labor and work. And if we have an AI that, you, you know, can scan thousands of uh, uh, papers and, you know, distill from them what is relevant to the research question at hand. This will facilitate research and scientific exploration. Do you see a room for that in, in your institute and in your university? Yeah, I think that can be done and, and, and AI can help us to do better science. But I will say that it will be good to do incremental science. So basically it will be based on what is already exists. I think there's one science that is still will be like the human one is, is like the, the creativity part, like the pure creativity, like, like for example, the best example would be Einstein. Einstein thought about a different, completely different world. There was no paper written about that. And he imagined something completely different then. And then at the end, we were able to use different experiments to prove that they, he was right. So that kind of science, I, I think is still human. The, the, the science that is really different and doesn't depend on on, on basically on the shoulder of giants. So, so of course you, you use a lot of work that other people did, but you need something to, to, to change that is not anywhere. So AI will not be able to do that. On the other hand, we, we had a very interesting seminar by, by Stephen Wolfram uh, last year, it was the last seminar of the year, it's in YouTube. And, and he said something very interesting. Something that AI can do is to explore worlds that we cannot explore. For example, imagine, imagine the world of, uh, let's say, vision. So AI can explore 
everything, everything, including things that we cannot see. The same with audio, including things that we cannot listen to. So, so, or for example, different dimensions, like, uh, for example, all possi possible combinations between a dog and a cat in an image. And he had something very interesting because in the space of images, there are some images that are combination of dogs and cats, but we don't see them. And, and there are so many that are infinite that we cannot explore them. But for example, uh, in that kind of exploration, maybe AI can find something completely new saying, oh, I found this, this kind of images that look cute. What do you think about it? But at the end, always a human will have to say, is this relevant or not? For example, you may do a very good literature review, but I, I will say that the best will be to, 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 to have a recommendations of what to read. I think these are the most interesting paper. Read these ones and then do the human understanding. Maybe we will miss some interesting papers, but, but we will find the, a lot of the right ones very fast. So this is something where, where uh, AI can help. AI can help us to, to know faster where to look. Sometimes in science, we are really exploring a lot until we find the right place. Where is the light? I think AI can help us to, to find where is the light, and then we explore the light, not AI. I want to end with some uh, with a question that is close to my heart, and it's very important for everybody who's listening. Um, so as we are watching and witnessing AI destroying one job and the other, and you know, with the release of this latest model, the 4.0, um, there was a, a post on LinkedIn that I saw where it says that goodbye uh, tutors so yeah. because this kid could you could you could have your child look at the math problem through the chat gpt and it will guide it will teach it will do all of that so if you have children um or youngsters who want to go to college or who want to pursue a career what would you recommend them to choose should they do plumbing and electrician and stuff that has manual labor because robots hasn't been uh, advanced yet or would you still uh, recommend them to go into knowledge work uh, should they go into industry because your resume as well is full of uh, you know uh, working in the industry or should they go academia and do research and this is something also i'm struggling to to think should i should i continue with phd or should i go to the to the industry uh, so what would what what is the general recommendation that you are giving to people that's a very tough question uh, before i joined northeastern the, the, the northeastern president joseph aun did write in 2017 a very interesting book called robot proof and the book is exactly the answer to your question what you need to learn to not be displaced by robots so I will not uh, uh, basically give away the main things there so people can read it. It's, it's a very interesting book, and also because he said he comes from the social science, not from, from engineering. But I think I prefer to think that instead of recommending something, it's better that every person thinks where are their potentials. I think I, think I prefer to, to develop these potentials. So like... In the future, if in the future machines do all the boring work, what I would like to do? And I think I will try to, to learn that. If in the future I can get a universal salary and do whatever I think I'm good at, but I need to do something. So like, like the social and the social contract will be, you need to do something useful to society. Then try to develop that. I think with these technologies, it's easier for many people to do that. For example, it's much easier for people to compose music, to write, um, for example, you may have the right idea for a novel, but then the system can generate part of the content, not all the content, but part of the content. And you need to say 60% uh, was written by this chatbot and so on. So, so you are transparent and, and, and ethical. So I would say that today we have the ability to use these technologies to basically achieve the, the full potential of every everyone. But for that, I, I would say to the entrepreneurs that they should think about how to empower people and know how to replace people, like you said. For example, tutors, 
I don't know what will happen. I hope tutors are still there because tutors can also uh, teach you things that are not in the screen, <laughs> right? And in the context is also important. You, you need to, there's more than just the knowledge of the screen. There are many things that are implicit, that they are contextual, they are common sense, and we need people to teach common sense. Great to have you, uh, Dr. Ricardo. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. And thank you so much for being on, on my podcast. Well, thank you, Nadia, for the invitation.